recording. Well, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, we have a guest tonight, Deborah Freeze, and uh, some other people who I don't even recognize. Her. That's great. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, maybe you've done introductions already, but let's try to do it again. And um, what's going on here? Chad Sanson, do you want to introduce yourself first? Welcome. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm Chad Sansing. I teach humanities at a charter school in Virginia and uh, try to set up places where people can talk about problems and solutions in education. Um, Ryan White, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Hi to you, the rest of them. Yes, we can read. Um, uh, my, my name is Ryan White. I'm, I'm from uh, Everett, Washington. Uh, I'm a uh, high school uh, chemistry teacher, oh. um, inter always interested in, in figuring out new ways uh, to connect with my students using uh, technology. Cool. Nice. Have you read the book or had a chance to read Walk Out, Walk On? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. Have you had a chance to read Walk Out, Walk On? No, no. I, I, question. Yeah, write it down. Let me I write gotta this get that down book. <laughs> That's okay, Ryan. You can still participate. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you know things even though you haven't read the book. Cool. Yeah, well, that's great. First, great, first good reference. Kelly. Uh, Kelsey. 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 Sorry, I got the name wrong. Kelsey, you um, ordered the book last week um, onto your, your reader. Is that right? Yes. Well, have you a chance to read much of it? or? I'm on page 38. I was working on it earlier today. Cool. Welcome. Introduce yourself a bit. I'm Kelsey. I'm a seventh grade student in a town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I like to think I have a different way of looking at things. What state is middle of nowhere? In? Indiana. And uh, your father should introduce himself too, just so we don't we know that everything's okay. Scott, welcome. Hi, my name's Scott. I'm a recent college graduate, a midlife career changer. In the process of looking for a job teaching kindergarten through sixth grade. And Kelsey's my daughter. and We're here well, about 30 feet apart in different rooms, but here we are. When he talks, I can hear him, and then I get the lag on the video. <laughs> I'll talk quieter. Um, and we have Chris Sloan and um, Monica Hardy and myself and, um, and Jeff Lee. And Mary Beth. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, Thanks this for joining us. Thing. Introduce yeah, yourself. Mary Beth, Mary Beth introduce yourself. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Mary Beth, and I am a technology teacher in Philadelphia. Um, blogger, tweeter, all that good stuff. Radical. <laughs> Still connected to the class. In a surfer kind of way. And our, guest, our, our main guest, I guess, here tonight is Deborah Freeze. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Um, and we want to introduce everybody like that because we want this to be a conversation um, as, as we go. Um, so, I, I, and I got here a little bit later than you all did. Did you start anything yet, uh, Monica? Or? Well, not on air, so I don't, I feel like we should go back. If, um, I don't know if Deborah's formulated any things. I've got a ton of questions to jump in, so. I don't know if she wants to say something before she gets attacked. <laughs> well, I, I realize that there's um, a range of familiarity with the book from uh, Monica at one end of the spectrum and those who maybe haven't had a chance to read or have heard of Walk Out, Walk On. So what I, what I can do, I really would just like to be in a conversation with each other and I have my own inquiry that I'm in, particularly with educators, from my own um, questioning about the way that we look at systems change and what's happening in school systems. But before we get into some of that, it might be helpful for me just to, to um, name what Walk Out, Walk On is, especially for those who are unfamiliar, and so, um, as well as the title of a book. 
Um, it's about walking out of failing dominant systems and walking on to build the new and to build a world uh, in which people live in healthy and resilient communities. And, and I think for this particular group, it's really important to hear where the term came from. Um, the term came from our friends in India. There's a guy named Manish Jain that we wrote about in the India chapter who founded an organization called Shikshantar in Udaipur, India. And he was working with young people. And as he met more and more young people throughout India, a lot of them had dropped out of school. They dropped out of high school or even younger. And he started to ask them about their lives and why they had dropped out. And they told them their stories. And they said, you know, the school system has said that we're failures and we've dropped out and we failed school. And as he listened to them, he discovered that a lot of them were turning to elders in their communities to learn things. They were finding craftspeople to apprentice with. They were in conversation and dialogue with each other. And he said, you know what, I don't know that you're dropouts. You're walking out of a system, not that you failed, but a system that has failed you. And you're walking on to find learning elsewhere in the world. And, and he created a network of walkouts, um, people walking out of school and walking on to create self-directed learning programs throughout India. And then in our work at the Burkana Institute, which was founded by my co-author, Meg Wheatley, we traveled in different places around the world and discovered that there were all kinds of people who were walking out of what they perceived as failing institutions and walking on to experiment with other ways of creating, whether it be learning or healthy food or a different way of relating to healthcare, whatever it was to build a healthier fabric of community. Um, so that was what we named the book after and also profiled communities in seven places around the world of people who were daring to walk out um, and walking on. And, and one more caveat, because I think this is really relevant to a conversation with educators, which is part of the distinction is about, um, in that case, it's a story of walking out of institutions. But we also explored the notion of simply walking out of limiting beliefs. You can stay inside of an institution and be a pioneer and walk on to create something new. Um, so the notion of walking out of beliefs like, you know, we should, uh, students need to score high on tests, right? That would be one limiting belief in our institutional culture and education today. And walking on to build some other set of beliefs about learning. So this question of, um, in the case of our schools, what do we need to walk out of and what are we experimenting with walking on to is the essential question that's in our book. So I'll offer that just to have a shared content. And then Monica and others, I'm happy to go wherever you guys want to go with it tonight. OK, well, I'll jump right in. Um, the movement that we're doing, um, we're calling a connected adjacency, where we're both out and in the system. And the, um, on the Burkana um, site, um, Deborah is doing a video of the two loop theory and I would love it if she would share that um, the analogy that she talks about and how she explains that because I think especially the ones I'm looking at here in the hangout are in the system and it, it can become very frustrating of what is my role I, I want to do this I can maybe do this in my classroom but how can I how can I feel better about this and that that two loop theory was great so okay so um, walk out walk on is actually built on this, uh, what we call this two loops model of systems change. And it's really a very basic, basic, um, it's not ours, it's a basic way of understanding how systems change. And the idea is that every system, so if you think of it as an upside down curve, right, every system rises and peaks and moves into decline. And somewhere around the peak of that system, alternatives to it begin to appear. I, if I could draw it for you, you'd see sort of like a curve going up, peaking and going down, and another one emerging from underneath it and rising, whoops, I put my hand in, rising up. And um, the idea is that complex, all systems are complex and interdependent and emergent phenomenon. Nobody planned the school system that we've got. Now, Arguably, some people might believe some people did plan it, but that would actually uh, go against our way of thinking and understanding living systems, which is they're not directly causal or linear or predictable. They're highly complex with lots of factors interacting at the same time, which means that they also cannot be undone. One of the ways of understanding systems thinking is that you actually can only 
tweak a system. You can own a, a living system, and I would say that sort of our educational systems are living systems. You can fix a mechanical system. You can transform a mechanical system, but with living systems that have humans in them, that have community in them, that have children in them, um, it's very hard to know how to undo an emergent phenomenon. And one of the suggestions in the two loops model is that you actually can't transform it. You can only abandon it and walk on to build the new. Now, that is not the only role that we suggest people play, that if we want to give rise to um, learning environments where children are fully self-expressed and inventive and creative and in community, um, it's not that we need to abandon our schools. There is a role that we talk about, which is people who are working inside the dominant system as, and this is a bit provocative, but as hospice workers. It's a dying, failing system. It cannot be saved, but there are people inside of it, individuals who can be helped, who can be given uh, love, compassion, kindness, perhaps slow down the decline, perhaps include those who are being excluded even from this failing system and include them better. So I, I offer this as a very provocative thing to say to people who are inside school systems right now trying to do their best with it as the analogy of a hospice work. If you believe that it is a failing system, and you may not, if you believe that it's a fundamentally failing system, then the role of working inside of it is good, important, loving hospice work. Another role is to walk out of that system and experiment with building an entirely different kind of learning environment. And there are some other ro roles as well, but I think we'll, we'll stick to those two. That's probably enough to throw into the conversation to get people thinking. Uh, so conversation, let's, let's jump on it. Um, you know, the, the going way back to the example of the students who had dropped out, um, and then it was, for them, they didn't actually do anything different when they became walkouts, right? I mean, they were already in that position. And I, I'm getting around to my question. To, to what degree is it about perception and then how perception changes what you actually do? Or is it about what you do? Is that a fair question? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's both. I think it has to be both because to one degree, you can, you can imagine a dropout who drops out of school and does nothing, does nothing to self-direct, does nothing to go find learning. And that's, so that's one kind of behavior. And there's a different kind of behavior that shows up when somebody begins to seek out learning among their community. Um, one of the critical pieces of that is other people alongside them who are doing the same thing. So that's where the naming of it matters, that when you name it, when you make the shift from being a dropout to being a walkout, and, and a, a young person can raise their hand and say, you know, I'm a walkout, and that person's a walkout, and that person's a walkout. By naming it, they can recognize each other, and they can create something together that they might not have been able to create in their own isolation. So I think it's both the behavior and the naming. Don't be shy, folks. Jump in. Yeah, because if you don't, I will. Um, I had a question. Um, I read the book, and um, you know, I, I was as probably not a surprise. I was particularly keyed into the the education parts of the book, and I was wondering if you could kind of uh, maybe for people who haven't read the book, um, I think the place was called uh, Unitera, mm -hmm. and then. Um, Kafunda had some education kind of uh, going on there, like the people te teaching each other, and then uh, I don't know how to say it, Shikshantar? Shikshantar, yep. Yeah, so like, can you maybe just describe those places to people and then maybe uh, talk about some commonalities that you noticed between those places? Sure. Um, the commonalities are going to be really strong because they have been learning partners with each other. And, and a lot of it, I'd say UNITIERA, Universidad de la Tierra, which is started in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, and is, has spread to other places, not in a franchise model, but in a sort of open source, try this out where you are model. Um, it's, a, it's a university. Um, it's self-directed learning, so it's really a place, and, and, and each one is very different. So the ones I know best are Oaxaca and Unitiera Chiapas. Um, they're places in which people can come 
with uh, a community context as well as people who function as mentors or advisors um, in helping them say what is my central learning question so my learning question might be about how to make solar roasted chocolate my learning question might be a philosophical question about the Zapatista movement. My learning question might be about um, bicycle-powered irrigation pumps. And if I come to this central place with my question, or even maybe I don't really know what my question is, but some people are going to help me refine it, then this place will direct me to both intellectual and pragmatic resources that will help me on my learning path. And if these people don't know someone, then we'll reach out another concentric circle of relationship in our network and find someone else who knows someone. So, so the Unitiera model is a very place-based model. The Swaraj model in, in uh, India, which is also university level, is um, a little different in that they come together at a campus-like place maybe three months and then they go out into very old-school apprentice-like models, the master-apprentice model, and then they come back together and learn together what are we each learning and then they go back out into an apprentice model until they're ready to develop um, an initiative for themselves. So I'm more familiar with the um, mostly like sort of post 18 year old model as a lot of these are around like kind of 18 to 30, year, 30 years old um, in, in those examples, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea of what this kind of thing would look like in the younger grades, because I, well, I shouldn't say grades, but age. Yeah. Um, but I, because I, as an elementary school teacher, I just feel like we wait too long to do these kind of things, to let kids have these experiences. Um, that, you know, by the time they're 18 or they're 17, they're 16, and these apprentice models are in place, that um, there's so much unlearning for them to do about kind of what learning is. So it's it's kind of fascinating for me to think about what, what would it look like to have that kind of model with kids who are eight, nine, ten years old. I mean that's really what Shikshantar has been experimenting it with and their main thing is around unlearning. And you know young people are there from any age and actually I think the real test is Manish who went to Brown University, got a master's at Harvard Ed School. His daughter, who's now about 11, I think, has never gone to a day of school in her life. And obviously that's a real challenge um, for you know her grandparents and um, many people in that family system. Um, she actually to this day is not chosen to learn to read and Manish is fully committed to the experiment of saying, I trust that Kunku will follow her learning passions. And she is a huge learner. She's been, I mean, she's all kinds of skills and gifts and exper experiences that um, are quite unusual for a child her age. But he's really, really boldly walking out of the model of a certain kind of curriculum goes with a certain kind of age. He trusts that she will get the skills that she needs at the age that she needs it. Now, I'm not recommending that we all go that radical, um, but but Shikshantar is filled with young people, very young people, who are saying, you know, I'm really hungry to learn from the shoemaker. I'm really hungry to learn about growing food, which is a really important one these days. Um, and allowing themselves to follow that. And that's one reason I like the book so much because I am going to go that radical. Krishnamurti writes um, that partial freedom is no freedom and that was one of the Krishnamurtis in the book. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to see that what we're looking for until we do get rid of um, us deciding what they learn. You know, I love the um, start anywhere, follow it everywhere. Um, that might be something else that I would love to hear your version of. You know, you probably have several stories that match up with that. So that's actually, um, that phrase, which was actually coined by um, Meg's co-founder of Burkana, Myron Kellner Rogers, um, it was probably the most influential thing that had me really dive into Burkana. So the phrase, start anywhere, follow it everywhere, is about working with emergence. And it means, it, you know, I came out of consulting. And in consulting, you know, what you do is you start with the time that you're in 
and you talk about where you want to go and you do the five-year gap analysis and you write the roadmap and then you plan, you lay out the roadmap for how you're going to get there in five years. And the truth is, um, it never ever happens that way. We never arrive at the five-year point the way we expected to because life is complex and unpredictable. And so Start Anywhere, Follow It Everywhere is talking about start right where you are with your greatest passion, your greatest curiosity, or your greatest pain point, whatever it is, and move into that. You don't have to know where you're going. You take that first step and then you stand in that new place, you look around you like you just did a little while back and you see where that leads and you follow that step and you follow that step. And so one of the things that we've talked about in even like in thinking about strategy is shifting from that kind of planning to working intentionally with emergence. If you apply that you know, to children and to learning. I mean, this is more your field than mine, but, but what might happen if a child's orientation was, where do I want to go now? What am I looking at now? Where do I want to pay attention now? And I suspect, you know, in our culture, we'd see a lot of video game playing. So the question is, how do you create the conditions for a broad appetite? Um, how does the environment that they're in or the place that they're in that this language of creating the conditions is the language of working intentionally with emergence. How do you create the conditions for them to make choices, their own volition, about start anywhere, follow it everywhere? What do they want to pursue next? So I, I offer that more as a question than an answer. I have no idea how that would work, but that would be applying that kind of thinking to a learning environment. I think another huge point, um, uh, we are connected now with the wilderness guy that runs with wolves and um, one quote that he has is you know sitting in the wilderness waiting for two to three hours five hours that there's never nothing going on and I think that applies to Manisha's daughter Yaakov Hecht writes about in democratic education letting a kid play soccer for three years and we just there's never nothing going on we had a six-year-old in the house last night and her parents were talking about what matters most what what should we be doing and I said ask her and she said what I'm doing right now and I mean if we could just grasp that you know that there's never nothing going on I and, and I oh I'm sorry we'll go, for go ahead go ahead Ryan go oh, ahead I was just thinking uh oh, what's happening? I was just trying to do it. Ladies first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, Paul was in my face. I'm like, wait, what, what's going on? <laughs> um, no, I just was thinking. I, I've I've not read the book, and I I've been meaning to get a copy of it because all my friends were about your book, Deborah. Um, but I'm curious if you talk at all in, or mention in your book um, the idea of the, the the free school model, the Sudbury Valley model, at all, because it sounds like it goes along with kind of what you're talking about. We didn't we didn't talk about that at all in our book, but it's interesting because I got introduced to that. We had some. Um, Meg is based in Utah, and the Sudbury School in Utah. The the people involved in that. Um, we got very involved and Manish was doing a lot of learning with them back and forth so um, a bit more about that free space um, but we were mostly looking in the global south more so than in the US and Canada um, okay. I, I was thinking about the uh, what you're saying about the, the, the choices based model and, and applying it to younger students it seems to me that um, that approach is, is Kind of like a, a Montessori approach, or at least what I understand about the Montessori approach is, is giving students choices. You know, giving them choices of, of different things that they can play with, which they categorize as work, because that's that's what it is for a for a four year old to be playing. He's he's working. He's figuring out you know different stuff and experimenting and all that. Um, and I've always wondered where where does that Montessori based approach go, you know, and all of a sudden it's, you know, time for first grade and no, nope, there you are in your, your, your 30 student classroom, you know. Ryan, remind us what, what age do you teach? I teach uh, high school, uh, like juniors and seniors, uh, chemist, chemistry class. Um, and I, you know, I, I would love to do a, a choice, a choices based um, curriculum, I, I, it, it just seems it'd be difficult from a from a resources standpoint. Um, you know, it's just easier to have them all do a lab with the same with the same stuff and do experiments with the you know in the same unit. 
you know, uh, as opposed to having all the lab stuff and and having having chaos, organized chaos occur, you know, where you have a bunch of different students blowing stuff up at their own pace, you know. I think one of the things that, um, I'll, I'll bring the two loops model back, because one of the enormous challenges is if you're trying to innovate inside the system, um, it will probably attempt to co-opt you in some way or make it really, really difficult to do things differently. So the notion of, you know, your Montessori question about up to a certain age or even that lab question, it's like, well, everything is set up to have things converge back to the system's predominant behavior. And which is why one of the conversations come up comes up, which is how much can an individual educator really experiment within the school system because ultimately first of all once the child moves out from under you what are they going to fall back into and again what are all of the pressures the resource pressures the time pressures the structure of the buildings everything is designed to be coherent as a system and that's where that question becomes what do, what does one do as an educator who wants to experiment differently from within the system versus how much does one have to step outside the system? Is that possible? Is that the only option? I, I don't have the answer to that. I think it's one of the key challenging questions in education right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where, someone else um, want to go? Well, I, I was just thinking along the lines of Montessori. Even in Montessori, this because I went to Montessori um, when, I, when I was, I guess, up until five or six years old, even then the teacher sets up the stations. And even then, while it's guided, it's still an adult has in mind what they want the child to be doing. Um, they, you, know, you know, the children can be creative and find ways to use the materials in ways that maybe the adult doesn't think of. But it's still, um, you know, set up for by an adult for children rather than children setting it up for themselves. So you know, going back to the idea of that. Um, just the system, you know, the way it's constructed, um, it, it's, you're still working within that kind of system. But um, one of the things I noticed in the book is that um, the children actually actively seek out elders mm -hmm. to help them uh, learn. So, I mean, there does seem to be a balance of like, you know, I teach high school and, um, you know, um, they're naturally curious and they do a lot of really interesting stuff given, you know, the freedom that I can give them. Which is pretty good. I mean, pretty fair amount. But you know, I think they also, um, whenever we do assignments where we talk to elders, or you know, whenever I am their elder imparting wisdom, uh, you know, I think they actually do like that stuff, though. So you know, I don't know that I could, you know, turn it. Yeah, I guess I'm, you know, part way in the spectrum. You know, I don't know that whether my kids really want to just totally chart everything. Um, that they want to learn. They want a lot of freedom, that's for sure. I, I mean, I think it has to be culturally appropriate, right? I mean, so one of the things, there's a huge difference in India than here around intergenerational relationships. Like most people, most people, kids in India are living in multi-generational family homes. So there's a, a much more intimate, constant relationship to elders. And we found the same thing in Zimbabwe that intergenerational learning was valued much people talked about intergenerationality more than they talked about youth right that the whole dynamic of relationship between youth and elders was one of the central learning leverage points that is much more challenging in this culture because we don't have that um, social fabric in our homes or even in our neighborhoods like we like like they do so I think that's significant and that's one of the things that we're calling out as a redefinition of No Child Left Behind. Can we, can we facilitate that every kid has that kind of a mentor, one that they've chosen, um, you know? I, th I do think that's important for this whole thing to happen, especially within a system. How would that work, Monica? Say, say more? Well, uh, what we're... The, the, the connected adjacency, us working within the system, 
the plan is mm -hmm. um, K through eight is like vast exposure. You know, it's like a, a really good unschooling home that they have all the resources they need. So now we have the city sharing all these resources. So um, what was uh, what were the elementary school buildings can now be spaces where you can host these. Um, 9 through 12 is like a quasi-college and kids are just floating around the city um, and the high school buildings are resource buildings and then 12 plus is like a quasi-career and no one ends up paying so much for university because now we've got the businesses plugged in. Um, but the way to make that chaos work within a city is we're not going to say you have to have 30 kids to a teacher. We, everyone has, and we, we're not going to say that kids can just be completely independent. Um, we're going to make sure that there's an inter interdependency going on, and it's, it's, you know, what they have in India and Africa. People are falling in love with if they feel like they have permission to do that because it's natural. It's natural to, you know, want to sit at the feet feet of someone who's been there and done that and it's natural for them then to want to go study more to talk the next day or find out whatever questions they had you know so we divided up the teachers in our district the staff by the kids and if you just do it that way it's about a 10 to 1 ratio and so you know Dennis Litkey is showing that some of this can happen and um, so anyway that's one of the things that we're focusing on is can can kids pick mentors for choice or can we create serendipity so that it's not even a big brother big sister thing I get, yeah I, and thinking lots of things as you're talking to uh, because most of what you're saying is is a vision is that fair I mean there's some plan in there too and, and I, I want to try to get around to the question that I keep thinking about, which is that, like, we're not all going to have the same kind of opportunity to walk out that, that Monica has had. Um, and so when do we know we've walked out? And you know what I'm saying? So we may feel like we walked out this year, but then we may look back at that next year and think, oh my god, I can't believe I was having kids do that. You know, I didn't really walk out at all. Um, you know, like, I, Chad, I think you talked about getting out of your own boxes kinds of things. Is that? Yeah, uh, it's very much a process of like you think you get out of it one year and then the next year comes along. Um, I, I don't know, I, I've just been thinking about uh, a, a cultural thing. It's partly my school, I'm sure, partly my classroom, and partly middle school students. Um, like waiting for uh, the emergence uh, of more self-directed learning. I think is something that needs to be I don't I don't necessarily think planned for, but accounted for and like how long it takes. Like I, I have some students today who've done some really brilliant projects in the past together. And today was a day they just fought tooth and nail against the uh, work that I suggested in the absence of work that they were suggesting. And so we went round and round and round and round about nice like phrase. work. Okay. And they, they were you know, they were very much asserting their independence, talking about what they liked, what they didn't like. And then, like, we get five minutes before the end of class, and all of a sudden we were back to, uh, can I go to the bathroom? And I was like, I didn't know what to tell them because we'd spent, like, 40 minutes where they were participating in equals in these kinds of failed negotiations about what we might do. And then at the end of class, we were back to, you know, like, asking permission to do something as basic as take care of a human need. Um, so I, I guess I would just say I think in whatever space you're able to create for giving kids more permission to learn, um, like just patience and appreciation for uh, the, the things they hold on to from, from the school culture, and classroom cultures, is important to think about and not get too flustered by. Yeah, it's a, your, your story reminds me of, um, we were, you know, one of the chapters in the book um, is about Columbus, Ohio, and it's called From right. Hero to Host, and it's moving from the heroic leadership model to the leader as host, mm -hmm. so I don't have all the answers. We collectively have the answers. And there are stories from some of the CEOs that we talked to, um, especially one that we wrote about in the book named Phil Cass, who, you know, he's like, he's like, I'm ready. I'm the CEO, and I am ready to surrender my power, and I'm going to distribute it to the staff. 
and he wanted to go cold turkey and people were not okay with that you know you have been the boss of me and I rely on you for the answers you're the one who's accountable I only have my part to be accountable for what do you mean I'm now accountable to I don't want to be and and so there's a readiness you can't just all of a sudden you know these kids have been in teacher directed environments and parent directed environments year after year after year and all of a sudden it's like hey in this classroom it's up to you and we wonder where their self direction is so there's some journeying through that has to happen and I think that connects your question Paul about you know when are we a walkout like uh, never always I mean it's not an arriving it's definitely not an arriving I mean the way that I think about it and I think it's helpful to think about it with anybody we're working with whether they're a young person or you know somebody that's on staff with us or whatever it may be I think of it as like moving our sets of beliefs from the background to the foreground that we have a whole set of ways that we look at the world that are from our culture our family our environment whatever it is and we're usually not aware that it's there and the whole sort of story of walk out walk on is distinguishing beliefs so if I have a belief in the background that a good leader is somebody who has all the answers and will be followed well, and I'm not aware of that belief, then I'm going to keep either beating myself up for not being clear enough and strong enough and certain enough, or overtaking everybody, right, as the overly heroic leader. If I become aware that I have a belief system in me about the heroic leader from dominant culture, and I become aware of it, I move it from the background to the foreground, I see that there's an alternative, the leader as host, creating the conditions or the space in which many people can come forward and contribute their gifts. Now, it doesn't mean I should always behave as the host, but I start to have more choice, or I talk about having the muscle of discernment as to when to be the hero and tell the kid when to go to the bathroom or not, and when to be the host to step back and create the conditions for their chaos and their confusion so they can offer their gifts. To me, it's an ongoing, constant practice, not unlike a meditation practice, like a daily practice of becoming aware, of distinguishing between how do I be now, how do I be now, what beliefs are operating on me, where am I speaking from. So I think it's just an ongoing delayering of, and this is the unlearning, unlearning and reclaiming new behavior. And I'd say, too, it's the hospice piece. I don't think we can make this change happen if, if the conversation doesn't change. We had a group of homeschoolers in the house last night, and they spent probably an hour talking about how to get the math done. Well, to me, that's the wrong conversation to be having. And so I think the Columbus, Ohio piece is huge because, I mean, and so that's one thing I wanted to ask you as well. It's any suggestions on how to really get that conversation going with parents so that it's not about how do I get math into my kid better instead what is it that I want out of this what how do we become us you know I think the focus of the conversation isn't yeah. what we really believe inside our guts you know I think there's um, the model of hosting is that there's an enormous amount of power in a really good question and for the most part Parents don't get to be in questions like, what does learning mean to me? What, what kind of learning do I want my child to have? What kind of creativity do I want them to experience? I don't know what the good questions are. I mean, you, you all would know that better. But the capacity to call people together, offer a good question, not like, you, you have no influence over the school system. Why would this question matter to you? Um, but the kind of questions that really mean something to us and to be in those together questions a really good question is one that doesn't have an answer it's unanswerable it's something that you explore and so the art of hosting which we write about in the book and which is an easy training and practice to bring into a community you can go to um, artofhosting.org to learn about how to do that but um, is, is a way of just convening people around questions that matter and through that creating a community of people who are connected to each other and want to advance their thinking together what I loved when I went there is the first thing they do is it's not even here's the questions it's tonight it's just what are the questions you know yeah. so a big focus on that Kelsey's hand is up great go ahead Kelsey I think you would be able to just go into it I think it'd be like learning to swim you could either just go in the shallow end and work your way out 
or be thrown in the deep end and just learn to do it yourself. I think it would work either way you'd want to do it. Yeah, you know what, that's a perfect distinction between the shallow and the deep because that's going to be a personal decision. I, I'm going to wager a guess, Kelsey, that you might be a deep end person, but there are probably some that might want it, like they want to do toe in the water step by step and some are like, throw me into it, let me at it, I want to see what happens, right? And, and how do we create the space for people to go at their own pace? Kelsey, I would add to that metaphor though that um, we don't know how some parts are and how shallow other parts are. <laughs> if I could, you know, I mean, I think it's complicated once we get in. Sometimes there's a drop off, and you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm playing too much with the metaphor. Can I, I, I want to shift a, a, a little bit to us. And, and Deborah and I did have a brief chat earlier in the week, and um, I asked her to, to see if we could do this. this is, and this is risky, but um, like, we're a community of sorts, and Chad, the, uh, the uh, co op. Catalyst, uh, cooperative catalyst is also a community, um, sure. and 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 I was fascinated by the part of the book where there was a distinction between um, a community of practice and, and a community of friends, and some of us are sort of friendly and <laughs> a practice. And Monica, I, and I'll kick it off with a positive story. We've started doing. Um, uh, Detox, and with, there's a new channel on Youth Voices called Detox, um, and and the kids are loving it. And so, like, sharing kind of practice back and forth is important. But I wonder if we have enough of a project ourselves at Teachers Seeking Teachers. Are we a community? Do we want to be a community? Do we have a? Is that? Is there any way to address any of that, <laughs> Deborah? Or help us think about what the questions are there. So um, one of the things that I would guide you to, um, it's on, I'm just, I think it's on the Burkana.org website, it's probably also on my website, DebraFreeze.com, I don't know if it's on Walk Out, Walk On, is an article that Meg and I wrote um, that's not in the book um, called um, Taking Emergence to Scale, no, uh, um, using, emergence to using the life cycle of emergence to take innovation to scale, something like that. Anyway, it's about the life cycle of emergence, but the point is, that it's um, looking at if you want to create systemic shift, if you want to create wholesale systems change, that at the time that the peak is happening and people walk out of the peak and they start experimenting as pioneers with the new, that is where networks matter a lot, that is where communities of practice matter a lot, and that's what um, we hope gives rise to what we call a system of influence, which is the new system. And so in that, we distinguish between a network, like for sure, this group right here is at minimum a network. Um, so a network is when people have a reason to associate with each other. And we, Meg and I, just, um, define it as out of self-interest. You participate in a network if you get value from it for your own needs. And as long as you're getting val value, you continue to participate. And once you stop getting value, you usually drop out. Now, that's our, our way of defining it, because we then distinguish that from a community of practice. And a community of practice is people who share practice. So let's say, you know, obviously as educators, but more than that, as educators really trying to stretch the question of how better learning could happen, I, however you would, would define that. Um, and you participate in that in order to advance the field. It's more than for my self-interest. It's more than to make me just a better teacher. And by the way, you can have people who are in it out of a network or a self-interested mindset, and you can have people who are in it to advance the, the field. So a community of practice, um, which Etienne Wenger did a lot of really great work around and wrote a, a good book called Cultivating Communities of Practice. Um, Meg and I believe that that's, that's the greatest leverage point for um, the emergence of a new system, that when people who share practice are in it as a community, they feel tied together for a greater purpose, um, then the kind of experimentation and innovation and, by the way, failure, the community can sustain failure in a way a network can't quite. If it, if it fails, nobody wants to participate in it anymore. But if there's a fabric of relationship, social relationship and trust, then, and the kind of experimentation that will fail over and over again as we invent the new, um, then a community of practice can, can do that. And so what does it take to be a community of practice? I mean, it's things like, you know, a really clear shared uh, purpose, clear set of shared principles about how you are together, 
some shared rituals. This is an, this is a particular kind of ritual. Um, and, and there's a lot more to say about communities of practice, which would include what do you want to create together? What small, start anywhere, follow it everywhere, what small step, little experiment might you either create together or might you each create individually and report on and share learning around together? So there's a whole lot more to say about communities of practice, but um, just from this call, I'd say there seems to be a lot of conditions present where you could either are one or could become one. Thanks. Those are useful terms. Other thoughts? I'd like um, to see sorry, Kelsey's I muted. diagram. Um, I, I was just thinking about, and I did have to step away for a moment, so you may have already said it, but um, okay. I was thinking about how we help young people create these communities. Yes, that too. Sorry, is my internet slow? No, you're okay. Okay. I, I think I was catching up there. Let's, um, let's, maybe we could hear from Kelsey there. Uh, Kelsey, do, do you have yeah. a diagram of some sort? Uh, maybe she can put it in the notes or the sketch pad or something? She could just hold it up to me. I drew oh, it on okay. the sketch I drew it oh, on the sketch pad. Oh, you did. How do we look at that? Oh, okay. Um I think like that. There it so is. This make for great great. Oh, you see it? Excellent. That's it. <laughs> there we go. I see it. Kelsey, you're taking us to new places. Describe this for us. <laughs> I drew the bell curve she was talking about. It starts just with a random idea, and it starts to get the followers and to pick up, and then when it reaches its peak, the people start to walk out to find different situations, because it's not working for them, and then it declines, and then poof, it's gone. Cool, Kelsey. Cool. Thank you, Kelsey. What does it say at the very bottom, Kelsey? It says education situation bell curve. Ah, <laughs> sounds like a wrap. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I do want to throw out to that. Or you go, Mary Beth. Were you done? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think if I can remember it. Oh, I was just, I was just thinking about um, young people and helping them build those communities um, that, that you know Deborah was talking about and how we help them um, build them amongst themselves and and also with mentors and people who are you know kind of cross-generational um, that was all that was was thinking of but um, yeah go ahead Monica <laughs> But just, just a quick thought on that. I, I think it's not maybe as essential that they build communities of practice, but I do think that some of the um, art of hosting processes would be of great value. So if you think about even just the physical way that children often sit in a classroom, which is you know side by side and looking at each other's backs and everybody's pointing toward the teacher um, versus in a circle, right? Is a, a simple thing um, where the the role of community and how you create the conditions of community and how you create the conditions of self organization, right? So communities of practice are emergent phenomenon. They arise from people coming together around a question or an interest or a practice that matters. But creating the conditions in which they can do that so they can see each other and form into small groups, which children are really inclined toward. Affiliation is really strong. They're always seeking to form groups. So um, it's, it's, we need to shift the physical model and the way that, the way that, we're in, that they're in relationship with each other in the classroom environment. Yeah, this sounds a lot like my student teaching experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Briefly, show, say that again, Scott. I was thinking um, that too. Yeah, in my student teaching, one of the, the first things we did was take the, the desks out of the you know rows and groups of four model, and, and we gave them freedom to move. You know, it's, your desk is just a place where your stuff lives. It's not where you have to sit. We took off the name tags. Um, and a lot of them just didn't get it, so we... Well, the first thing we did, we took their chairs away, if, if they so chose. We, we gave them a choice between a 
exercise ball, a chair, or a stand-up desk, which is a recycled AV cart. So we gave them choice of seating, and then we put in drawers in the room, a little roll cart with three or four drawers in it, and took away their desks and put in tables. So your stuff lives elsewhere. You sit where you want, make a good choice, because you can't always sit by somebody that you know, some you just don't get the work done, so you have to choose wisely. Your group moves every day. You, your stuff lives wherever, and and in third grade it worked. I mean, but there were always a, a few early adopters that were like, "Yeah, I'm free. I can go wherever." And there were some that still their all their gear was in a drawer, and they still sat in their chair at their desk, and they were like they were handcuffed to it. It's like the, the elephant on the small chain that didn't think they could move. But it, so what you're describing here is, is very similar to what we did in third grade. Yeah. I think your title is very helpful as well. I mean, there's so much to learn from a walk. There's a lot of people that have written about it, um, especially one of, you know, that's usually here, Marianne Riley, um, writes quite a bit about walking, you know. Then those communities, I think, are formed in a more natural, choice-driven manner. Chris, I don't think you said a word. Have you? Yes, a little bit. Okay. I guess I wasn't listening then. <laughs> <laughs> I won't take that personally. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, I was just thinking about that when we were talking about Columbus, Ohio, about the Ohio State example as really a parallel to a lot of what we're in. You know, we're in these educational institutions, but, you know, we aren't really... <coughs> asked to, um, uh, you know, give our opinion. <coughs> sorry. What was that, that wasn't a technical difficulty. That was a physical one. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. uh, I was just saying that we aren't often asked enough, you know, to give our input into the system. Yeah. One, one of the things uh, I, I do is when I announce the show, I, I put it out on the um, tech liaison um, listserv with the National Writing Project, and somebody from Ohio um, sent back a, a note today and said that she had uh, gotten the book because of all our fuss about it, and um, had read it and, and contacted some people at Ohio State, and she was going to a hosting meeting. Um, so mm -hmm. she couldn't come on the show tonight. But um, it was, it's, so it's kind of, kind of nice to see what kind of ripples there are from just start talking about this kind of thing. Um, that's that's great. Um, do, um, Deborah, you have any thoughts? Uh, we're, we should get to, to finishing up here, I think, kind of soon. But maybe you could lead us in in final thoughts. Here. Yeah, I mean, I just offer my final thought is actually related to what you just spoke, and I'd love to hear any any other final reflections from people of just what sort of strike is the question they're sitting with or what strikes them. Um, but my final thought is really when I think about recall Ohio State or any of the other stuff going on in Columbus, um, place matters a lot. So it's really good to have this kind of connecting space, what we called what we call in the Burkana community translocal learning. So all learning is local, but and it can travel uh, from place to place to place and get relocalized. But there's nothing that replaces having a small and maybe large community in your school or in your community, in your neighborhood, um, because that's where the real shift is going to happen. So the question, I think, for a group like this is, how do you support each other in creating the links that you need to create at home so that the experiments that you want to be in um, have community behind you? And it doesn't need to be a lot of people to begin with. But again, whether it's a few people in your school or in your school district or uh, you know, parents and neighbors, um, some way of grounding it in place to feed back out into this kind of a learning environment. That would be my, my last thought I'd leave you with. Great um, Should we just go around and hear? I, I like the way you said that. Uh, any questions or wh where's this leaving you? And I'll just identify people just because it's easier. I'll point to you. <laughs> Chad. Who? Me? What? Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> I'm poking you. No, sorry, I was just thinking. Um, I've just been thinking a lot about uh, being in a system and, and emergence and people's relationship to it, 
and how more robust communities can kind of um, go through cycles of failure and, and survive. And thinking about and thinking about the co-op, but also the school at which I work and, and other initiatives that I'm familiar with. Um, it seems to me like a uh, a lot of invitation, kind of like a, not necessarily a wide net, but just an open invitation, uh, a place where a lot of people can come in and try on an idea or explore it. Um, that's the best kind of buy-in and participation from people that will sustain the community and and connections out to people who maybe want to be in that network but not in the the, the more active community per se. Chris. Yeah, I think there's uh, you know another lesson to be learned about. Um, I I don't know how to pronounce the word, but and I don't remember where in the book it is, but it talks about uh, the characteristics or the unique characteristics that place bestows on varietals, and it's talking about wine growing, and uh, terroir maybe is how you pronounce that. But um, you know it reminds me of why big. Uh, reform movements don't work on the local level. Uh, it, you know, it's because, like, the theme that develops over and over in this book is that uh, problems are problems are solved on the community level, and that's one of the big takeaways, I guess, for me from the book. Ryan, what's what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, I was just. Kind of reflecting on the, the the Montessori stuff at like the beginning of education, and then my my PhD chemistry program, which sounds a lot like choice driven, where I was kind of spit out at the end of like fourteen years of education, and and they're like, all right, well now what do you want to what do you want to study? You know, you you can study anything you want. You know, go for it. You know, and and it was just like I had a hard time. I, I had a hard time adjusting to that because it was like I'd been programmed. You know, talk about the the unlearning. You know that I had to do. Um, but I think what one of the reasons why I why I kind of search out these groups and interactions is because yeah, it's it's tough you know, when you're in a system where people don't. You know, people so ingrained a certain way of doing things, and and this. These types of groups are really um, uh, empowering for me because they kind of connect me with with a community of, of people that are like-minded, and, and hopefully something um, something gets generated out of it. You know, changes the direction of things. Ryan, was this your first time? This was your first time with teachers teaching teachers, I think. Right? First time, yeah. I heard about it through uh, the Classroom uh, 2.0 website. Steve Steve Hargadon. So great. So it wasn't too painful. You, thank you. No. Come back again. Y'all are y'all are nice folk. <laughs> cool. Uh, Scott, you have any final questions, thoughts? Now we'll get to uh, the Yeah, we. I have a lot to think about tonight, but the, the I guess the most important is Paul. You talked about the our community and how we interact our our group that's here. You know, and is it a necessity or is it, you know. It, a lot of us are in the situation in our school buildings where we're an island. We're the only one that's like we are. We're agents of changes and on the leading edge, but the majority of folk don't think and do like we do. And I think our community, you know, the teachers teaching teachers and all, all of the, the global community like we have here is, is, a, is a real necessity right now. Maybe someday it won't be, but glad to be here. Mary Beth. Uh, well, I'm glad I showed up. I wasn't sure if I would because I hadn't read the book. Um, but I am definitely excited to. I feel like I'm kind of at that part in my career where I'm either going to walk out, <laughs> um, not leave teaching, but just walk out. And I, it's, you can only be as, um, you know, you can only be that, that, that one person in your school for so long before you kind of just feel like you're going to go crazy. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm at that point and I'm struggling with do I walk out or can I stay in and still um, still be a change agent and still feel and not go crazy. <laughs> so um, 
I'm looking forward to reading the book, especially since it seems like it's not um, focusing so much on U.S. education. Um, that's kind of neat. So, um, thank we're you, taking, Deborah. We're taking bets, Mary. <laughs> Whether you walk bets. out or not. Whether you walk out or stay, <laughs> or you go crazy. Never mind. Uh, What's the over I, under? No. I don't know. <laughs> Kelsey, Kelsey um, last last word for you. I actually have two things. The Great. first is I really like the imagery in the book. It wasn't like you were reading about the place. It was like you were at the place. I liked that. I like to write, so. And I was thinking about inviting someone to come with me next week. I wanted to know what you all thought about that. I've been telling her about it every week. I tell her what we've been talking about, and she seems really interested. So I wanted to, wanted to know if you'd be okay if I invited her to come on. Is Absolutely. your dad going to cheat her into Google Plus as well? <laughs> Kelsey, is she gonna be sitting a student? next to you or, or virtually? No, sitting next to me. Kelsey, okay. we would love it. We would love it sitting next to you. I, I do get nervous about encouraging, uh, you know, people under 18 to use this. But anyway, you're welcome. But uh, as long as your dad says it's cool, I'm cool. Um, Jeff, Jeff Lebo, we always thank you at the end here. But uh, you have any thoughts about, uh, you started uh, some of these community things a while ago and thinking that, that uh, these tools would help us do that. But, uh well, firstly, thanks for letting me hang out. I've really enjoyed uh, listening in. And, you know, I think it's important to celebrate the joys and successes of walking out and to show that the failures aren't devastating. You know, I think there's a lot of people that won't put their toe in the pool at all, whether it's shallow end or deep end. And the more that, and I think the pe people in this community of communities are the you know people who can model that hey it's it's okay you know it can work and and uh, the more that's celebrated and modeled the the more walking out can happen and we tell stories and that's certainly what the book does too so thank you for that Deborah <laughs> um, Monica you have any thoughts to end on well, I I would like to share um, the part of the um, Columbus Ohio art of of hosting that we're experimenting with, and I like that Jeff is here and Paul as well. Um, what I learned from going web was, um, like Mary Beth said, that I'm not crazy, you know, that there's other people like me. So now what we want to do, because we love the translocal, can we have these art of hosting meetings that are set up? Um, so maybe we have 25, 50 people coming every week but over 90% of the community are tapped in in one way or the other. Either they they lurk on the live stream that we have for the whole city, and then maybe they join the Hangout one week, and then maybe they're starting to show up face-to-face -face as well. I think, I think that's what the web wants us to do, is to learn transparency and connections, and then take it back and, and pretend like our city is the world. And you know, instead of, I can talk to India, I can talk to the guy two blocks down, because the tech is allowing him to feel comfortable enough to come into the space. So we're real looking forward to seeing how that pans out. And you, your researchers who are looking at the, um, the detox stuff, have them um, check our stuff out. I will, <laughs> see yeah. How, see how far off we are. But we, we put our toes in. And we're, we're there's no, there's no right or wrong, though, so. I know. Thank I'm you. Gonna for that was a very helpful comment. By the way. So, so I have some of them are twenty seconds long, and a kid did one twenty-two minutes long today. So, there you go. As it should be, Paul. Do you have any final words? Yeah, yeah who knows? Um, I, I just, um, I, I think we, uh, yeah, I want to keep pushing, trying to figure out who we are as a community. Um, Monica, when when you uh, decided to join with us, it was. Uh, it, you know, it was a shift in our community, and and I think it's we're we're at a time now when we can kind of think about who we want to be, and and, and I'm excited about those notions. Um, so, um, and and I think this book has helped us, um, has given us some language for for talking about us ourselves, and um, as well as in our individual communities as well. Um, we should probably finish off. Um, we do want to mention Dave Cormier because he, he messes around at edtechtalk.com 
and say that we've been broadcasting um, literally over the edtechtalk.com um, uh, channel of the World Bridges Network. And thank you, Jeff, for setting all that up for us and for being there when we get in trouble and our computers die on us and everything else. But thank and you for so being much, funny. <laughs> Deborah, thank you so much. Um, anytime you want to pop back in, anytime you have some questions for some educators, we'd love to be uh, to uh, you know give you some feedback on what we're thinking. That's great. I'd love to come back sometime. That'd be great. great. Thank, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank love, you all. Love all that you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Good night, y'all.